So, uh, good evening, everybody, my dear friends, colleagues, dis distinguished ambassadors, diplomats. I'm delighted to open the Balfour Declaration Conference. The state of Israel, as well as Jewish and Western culture, are partially marked by the digit seven. This digit is significant in many respects. To name but a few, the world was created in seven days. Our week is composed by seven days. Uh, apart from seven, also November plays a pivotal role in our Jewish modern history. Balfour Declaration was written November 2nd, 1917. Seven in. Uh, 100 years ago, and the recognition of the State of Israel by the United Nations took place on November 29th, 1947. So, we celebrate a Balfour Declaration Centennial 70th anniversary to the UN resolution, and in a few months, 70th anniversary to the State of Israel. This gives us many reasons for reflections and thoughts. The Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, the emblem of which is pomegranates, marking scientific richness, and the candelabra with again seven branches, has thus decided to devote several events to these anniversaries and to try to scholarly examine them from various points of view. <clears throat> we inaugurate these events today with a conference on the Balfour Declaration and with an exhibition on Balfour, the Declaration, and its impact on the global order then and now. The Balfour Declaration was sent as a letter to Lord Rothschild. The ties with the Rothschilds keep going on here. Yad Nadiv, the Rothschild Foundation, is a fantastic partner to many activities at the Academy and a great supporter of science in Israel. Balfour is the hero of the day. And alongside him stands another hero, Chaim Weizmann, the statesman and scientist who arguably motivated this document. The role of Chaim Weizmann as a statesman and scientist and his ability to integrate both was explored by the Academy several years ago in a special conference and an exhibition. And now we add to, to this the wide historical, geopolitical, and legal dimension. As a law professor interested in documents, contracts, I can tell you that usually a letter or even a letter of intent does not have a binding effect. But as we see, Sometimes it does, depending on real intent to be committed and circumstances. We have gathered to this conference a plethora of topics and speakers. I would like to warmly welcome our distinguished visitors from Istanbul and the United States, Professor Soli Ozel, uh, Professor Susan Pedersen, who will address us shortly, and Jonathan Gribetz, and of course, a warm welcome to all the Israeli participants. Allow me to convey special gratitude to Professor Yosef Kaplan, uh, the head of humanity section at the Academy for his commitment and wonderful work, and to the other members of the steering committee of this conference, Benny Kedar, Shlomo Avineri, Billy Melman, for an excellent work. <laughs> 
The Balfour exhibition was made in collaboration with the National Library and Yad Ben Tzvi. Special thanks go to Dr. Nirichil Shalev Khalifa and the whole staff. And again, to Billy Melman for her invaluable support. Special thanks also to my dear friends, Dalia and Eliyahu Cohen for their wonderful contribution, the Balfour carpet. And uh, of course, you are all invited to watch, see the exhibition. Finally, thanks to the staff of the Academy, in particular, our director, Galia Finzi, Sima Daniel, Ziva Dekel, uh, who is else here? I don't want to omit anyone for their endless efforts. So to conclude, I wish you a pleasant evening and fruitful discussions tomorrow. I thank you all for coming. And I pass the baton to my dear friend, Billy Melman, an academy member, a world-renowned historian, to present our keynote speaker, Professor Susan Pedersen. Please, Billy. Well, thank you, Nili, for your uh, words. And I would like to thank my colleagues um, on the steering committee um, of this event, Benny K. Dar, Shlomo Alvineri, and uh, Yosef Kaplan. And thanks again, I have to say, it, uh, to the wonderful staff of the Academy, to Galia, who over the last two months spent literally days and nights seeing this project through, to Sima and Ziva, to Nirit Shalev Khalifa, who curated uh, the exhibition, and to the staff. When my colleagues first thought of putting together a conference um, on the Balfour Centenary, I was a latecomer to the committee. They were perfectly aware that this November would bring about a multitude of Balfour events, academic and non-academic alike. The thought that guided them, us, was to rethink the contexts, dynamics, histories, many afterlives and interpretations of the Balfour Declaration and to reconsider them from a number of aspects, not least from the international interwar aspect. And no one can do this better than Susan Peterson. Professor Peterson is Morris Professor of British History at Columbia University, which she joined in 2003 after a successful and rather long term at Harvard University, first as an undergraduate, then as a graduate, and eventually as Professor of History and Dean of Undergraduates. From the early 1990s, she has been quite a presence in a number of fields, including uh, the comparative history of the welfare state, gender and family history, comparative imperial history, and the history of international organizations. Her list of publications is quite astounding, and I shall only mention highlights, and which are not just to list them, but in order to point at important turns in her work. She authored Family, Dependence, and the Welfare State, which appeared in 1993, and is key to any consideration of the ways in which Western, European welfare, some of them democracies, tied together notions of dependence and gender to citizenship and welfare. Her exemplary biography of the now almost forgotten most important female uh, politician in the first half of the 19th century, Eleanor Rathbone, revealed the layers of um, feminist and suffragist activity, humanitarian activity, social reformism, and um, other kinds of involvement in politics and appeared in 2004. And one would assume that her deep uh, acquaintance with Rathbone 
led her to considering the fantastic, to first consider the fantastic archives of the League of Nations um, in Geneva because Rathbun was involved with uh, the League. And um, perhaps then, Professor Peterson's long and arduous journey into the study of the mandate and the league started. And she traveled far and wide to and in archives in a number of continents and on the way um, to the end result, which is her book, uh, The Guardians. On the way, she produced a number of key articles. For example, her review article which announced that we are back to the League of Nations and later out of Iraq in 1932 which considered Britain's quitting of the mandate and the politics that led to it in this country and her, then her riveting Ford Lectures series at Oxford on the League. In, in uh, 2015 came out her widely acclaimed and award-winning The Guardians, The League of Nations and the Crisis of Empire, published by Oxford University Press. This panoramic book is a manifestation of the revival of interest across the humanities and the social sciences in that organization. And I think that when Professor Peterson started to get interested in it, it was considered a dead and boring and a boring subject. And, research, and um, research on it was frowned upon because it was considered uh, a failure, certainly in terms of security policies. But as many a historian would tell us, the histories of so-called failures are sometimes much richer and more, and, and more rewarding than the histories of successes. It is a panoramic history of the, mandate, of the mandate system, not only in the Middle East, but elsewhere as well, in Africa and in the Pacific. And at its center is the permanent mandate committee. And it, it, it is not only a uh, history of international politics of empires and internationalism, but also a history with people who seem very alive, bureaucrats or mandate experts who become the unsung heroes of the, and failed heroes of the interwar period. In addition to all that, it, it is beautifully and lucidly uh, written and was acknowledged in two uh, prizes, uh, the Gondel Prize for Historical Literature and the Lionel Trilling um, Award. In addition to being a prominent historian, she's a wonderful mentor who apprenticed generations of young scholars, including quite a few young scholars coming from uh, Israeli universities to Colombia. She will talk to us on the writing of the Balfour, on writing the Balfour Declaration into the Palestine Mandate. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peterson. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> And thank you very much for this invitation. I'm honored to be here today. In speaking to you, though, I'm well aware of the limits of my competence. I'm not a historian of Israel, Palestine, or the Middle East. I'm a historian of Britain, and latterly a historian of the mandate system of the League of Nations, that regime of international oversight under which the victorious allied powers admitted their, administered their seized Ottoman and German territories after the First World War. It's only because Palestine was part of that system that I had to work my way through its complex interwar history. But for me, Palestine is only one of 14 mandated territories administered by seven mandatory powers, all of which one has to attend to if one wants to grasp the meaning of the mandate system as a whole. <laughs> 
and that systemic understanding was my goal. I wanted to understand what difference was made by what I called internationalization, the displacement of some amount of authority to the international realm. How did that affect the legitimacy of mandatory rule, the lives of populations living under mandate, and especially the nature of the imperial order? After 10 years of work on this question, I came up with an answer that satisfied me. I'm persuaded that the establishment of a of an apparatus of scrutiny, publicity, and petitioning in Geneva did matter, although not quite in the way its framers intended. Although set up to legitimate the rule of powers granted mandates, that apparatus made not only that rule, but the imperial order as a whole more contested and vulnerable. But only historians of international institutions and international law are really interested in systemic consequences most historians write in national fields and are like citizens carrying passports or speaking the national tongue, interested in what international regimes mean for the places they study and live. Historians of Israel and Palestine, I imagine, rarely plow their way through the accounts of Samoan risings or Rwandan famines that dot my book. I bet they turn instead straight to the sections on Palestine, since their question is not what difference did the mandate system make for the international order, but rather what difference did it make for this particular and national history? That's a good question to pose for the case of Palestine in particular, for in no other instance was internationalization carried so far, and in no other case were its consequences so profound. The mandated territory included a number of international hotspots. Syria, so harshly subjected that its capital came under bombardment by French guns. Southwest Africa, which became a byword for race-based administration. Rwanda, whose later tragic history is prefigured in Belgium's rule through a Tutsi chiefly class. Nauru, comprehensively degraded and impoverished as phosphates were stripped from its land but no territory aroused more international scrutiny than Palestine. From the League itself, from states with significant Jewish minorities, from native and diasporic Arab and Jewish populations, from humanitarian bodies, and from religious interests of all kinds. The League's Permanent Mandates Commission, charged with reviewing reports and petitions on each territory, spent a disproportionate amount of time on Palestine, it absorbed two of only three special commission sessions. Although there were 14 mandated territories, a third of all petitions sent to Geneva were about Palestine. Permanent lobbies or missions were established there by the Zionist organization and the Syro-Palestinian Congress. But what is most remarkable about Palestine is that Britain welcomed and fostered that internationalization in sharp contrast to virtually every other mandatory power, all of which scheme to limit information, deflect scrutiny, and subvert the system. Britain, by contrast, deliberately looked to the international realm to legitimate its highly controversial Zionist commitment and stabilize its rule. As I shall show at the end of this talk, that strategy backfired, but its effects were profound. For the internationalization of British policy mattered, Take the case of the Balfour Declaration, the subject of this conference. A great deal of ink has been spilled on the Balfour Declaration, but to my mind, the most important thing is often overlooked. The Balfour Declaration was a wartime promise amid a host of ambiguous wartime promises, some kept, some not, about a land Britain was just in the process of occupying and knew precious little about. What made it significant was that it was internationalized, becoming the foundation for an international legal instrument, the mandate for Palestine. The declaration was incorporated word for word into the preamble and supplemented by specific clauses stipulating Britain's responsibility for policies aimed at promoting the Jewish national home. It was ratified by the League of Nations, the closest thing to a world government yet established. Unlike the Balfour Declaration then, which Britain had issued at will and could fulfill or repudiate at will, the ma mandate was an international instrument. It may have been drafted by Britain, but it could not be redrafted except with the consent of the League Council, 
It could be flouted, but only if Britain were willing to bear the cost of League censure. The mandate and not the Balfour Declaration gave the Zionist project the protection of international law. Yet, as Malcolm Yap pointed out in a wonderful lecture given here more than 20 years ago, historians have paid much less attention to the drafting and passage of the mandate than they have to the declaration. That's a problem. For as Yap puts it, without the mandate, I quote, there would have been no Israel because nothing else would have prevented Britain from unilaterally redefining her obligations in relation to the Jewish national home and stopping its development at a point well short of the possibility of statehood. I agree with that statement. Without the mandate, it's quite possible that Britain would have limited Jewish immigration and moved away from the Zionist pledge in 1930 when High Commissioner John Chancellor and Colonial Secretary Lord Passfield, that is Sidney Webb, proposed to do so. Given its significance then, it makes sense to pay a bit more attention to just how the Balfour Pledge became a League mandate. That outcome was not a foregone conclusion. Not only had Britain to accept the mandate for Palestine, and Balfour, remember, wanted the Americans to take it, but they had to overcome a host of objections. What we might call Balfour policy was not popular with the British military administration in Palestine, and especially not with Field Marshal Edmund Allenby, who flatly refused to publicly commit Britain to a policy he thought would alienate the majority population. It was not popular with Lord Curzon either, who replaced Balfour as Foreign Secretary in October 1919 and would very much have liked to reverse course. As we know, those critics were argued down. At San Remo in April 1920, the Allies allocated Palestine to Britain and agreed it would be administered in keeping with the Zionist pledge, a decision Heim Weizmann proclaimed as, and I quote, as significant as the Balfour Declaration. Herbert Samuel was installed as first High Commissioner soon after. And yet British policy remained controversial, and neither knowledge nor time seemed to be on the Zionist side. As Richard Meinertshagen in the Colonial Office's Middle East Department noticed, whenever British officials traveled to Palestine, the quote, local atmosphere gave them pause. To Weizmann's disgust, even Samuel, after a year or two in post, grew doubtful that the Arab population could ever be reconciled to the Zionist policy and jettisoned the language of the, quote, Jewish national home for a rhetoric of joint Arab and Jewish efforts to construct their, quote, common home. Time, too, caused problems, especially after the mandate text was published in December of 1920. An Arab delegation traveled to London to appeal against it, and Arab petitions deluged the League. It didn't help by this point that the United States had turned against the League and was inclined to be obstructionist, or that the other Allied powers were at loggerheads. British attempts to get the mandate through the League Council had to be repeatedly postponed in 1921, failed in January 1922, and failed again in May 1922. Not until July 24, 1922, did the League Council finally approve Britain's Palestine mandate. Just how the mandate survived, or more precisely, how a mandate incorporating the Balfour Declaration survived is then a real historical question. After all, July 1922 is four and a half years after November 1917, and four and a half years is a long time in politics. That question can be broken down into three separate inquiries, and the answer to how the mandate survived has partly to do with the fact that they were kept relatively separate and sequential to each other. Those questions are, first, how did the Balfour Declaration come to be written into the mandate for Palestine, a text completed for the Zionist clauses by December 1920? Second, why didn't the massive Arab mobilization against the mandate in 1921 and the doubts within it, within the British establishment, lead to a change of course? And third, how did Britain manage in 1922 to get the text through a fractious and unpersuaded League Council? I'll touch briefly on the first two questions, but I'm going to concentrate on the third. The first two have been investigated pretty thoroughly already. But the third intrigues because it's here that Balfour's own influence was decisive. 
At key moments, Balfour reinserted himself into the diplomacy over the ratification of the mandates, limiting the authority of the League Assembly to return control to the League Council, a council dominated by the great powers, and then overcoming American, French, and Italian hostility uh, to force the mandate through. There are some oversized characters in the story of Israel's founding, none more so than Weizmann, but I'm going to make a case today for the significance of a man who knew fairly little about Palestine and its problems and couldn't be bothered to learn, but who decisively affected its history anyway. Let me remind you of what we know about the first two questions, that is about the drafting of the mandate and the management of protest and dissent. There is a charge that the British, in response to Arab pressure, and especially at Curzon's insistence, quote, whittled down the mandate, but it doesn't hold much water. For as Yap points out, British participation in the whole drafting process was passive or reactive, with initiative left to the Zionist organization. If any whittling down was done then, it was a, of a mandate that Britain had not drafted, embodying promises they had not made, and to which they would have been frankly mad to agree. What is more significant is that Weizmann and his colleagues were in on the drafting process from beginning to end, and second, that the mandate in its final form contained a great deal of what they wanted. Not only was the Balfour Declaration incorporated in full, but the mandate also recognized the, quote, historic connection of the Jews to Palestine, a statement Curzon fought unsuccessfully to remove, defined the majority population as non-Jewish rather than native, uh, since the Zionists contended Jews should be regarded as native as well, and constrained the mandatory power to collaborate with the Jewish agency, foster Jewish immigration, and promote close settlement by Jews on the land. It was process, more than conviction, that led the British to accede to those provisions, a process of conciliation among a group that included only British officials and Zionist representatives. Small wonder, then, that when the mandate was thrown into a wider world in December 1920, it aroused consternation. 1921 and the first half of 1922 saw a sustained mobilization against the mandate by Arab organizations, a mobilization that included Arab representations and protests, massive transnational petitioning, and the dispatch of a joint Muslim-Christian delegation to London. That mobilization won a public response from the Times to the House of Lords, but had no impact on the mandate text. In her book and in an article pointedly titled, Was Balfour Policy Reversible? Zahar Hunaidi has carefully detailed precisely how that mobilization was managed, but the operative word is managed. Arab representations were received and answered, but their critiques were never taken on board, their spokesmen never taken into confidence. It isn't just that no one was granted Weizmann's level of access or influence, it's more that no one got any hearing at all. Arab protests never dislodged the Balfour Declaration from its position as an antecedent commitment, one to which the Arabs would have to accede before they could gain a hearing. That requirement took other pledges off the table. The development of representative institutions had to be suspended, Churchill explained to the cabinet in May 1921, quote, owing to the fact that any elected body will undoubtedly prohibit further immigration of Jews. Privately, as we know, Arab mobilization rattled Samuel and shook the cabinet as well. But the cabinet's discussion of 18 August 1921 was inconclusive. The cabinet agreed that the situation in Palestine was distinctly worrisome. But when the options were laid out, either the government could set up an Arab government, refer the mandate back to the League, and stop the immigration of Jews, or it could stick to the Balfour commitment and arm the Jews, the cabinet couldn't come down on either side. A memorandum by Weizmann was read, which urged the cabinet to turn over authority over immigration to the Zionist organization itself, but the cabinet couldn't agree to that either. As Balfour himself wasn't present, the discussion was adjourned. It was never resumed. So what accounts for Britain's willingness to stick to the Balfour Pledge through this period of protest and uncertainty? Accounts of Britain's policy in the Middle East and of the commitment to Zionist aims tends to turn on an analysis of interest. Britain hoped to placate Anglo-American Jewish interests during the war, one argument goes. Britain thought it could draw on Jewish capital to develop the Middle East, goes another. 
These arguments capture aspects of Britain's thinking, including Balfour's thinking, but do not suffice. British politics worked and works in a particular cultural milieu with policies set through confidential discussion among a small handful of trusted interlocutors. The single most important fact about policy making on Palestine is that that trusted inner circle excluded any representative of Arab interests, but included Heim Weizmann. The preeminent importance of Weizmann in securing the Zionist cause has long been acknowledged. Yehuda Reinhardt quotes Harry Sacker's opinion that, quote, without Dr. Weizmann, we would have neither received a declaration nor a mandate nor international recognition of a Jewish national home in Palestine. This may sound excessive, but I think it is basically correct. Weizmann's significance is that he was fully incorporated into an inner circle of policymakers. We have seen that he was central to the drafting of the Palestine Mandate. We have seen that he was able to be vicariously heard in cabinet. Evidence of his extraordinary political skill run through colonial office records. These make it clear that Weizmann was given key documents about British policy in advance or helped to draft them, that he was shown secret and personal communications by Palestine officials, that officials held up formulating policy until they could doc discuss it with Dr. Weizmann, that it was agreed that he would be given material both formally as well as informally, thus mirroring his own practice of submitting memoranda from the Zionist organization, quote, privately, before putting anything forward, quote, officially, and of writing a formal letter as head of the Zionist organization alongside a personal letter explaining how it should be handled. When Weizmann cabled Churchill from the Zionist Congress in 1921 to ask for an official statement of British support, he got one. When he headed to Geneva, British officials there were told that, and I quote, we are in very close relation with Dr. Weizmann here and make a point of treating him with confidence and consideration. He was so thoroughly enmeshed in British policymaking that to question his right to be taken into confidence would have seemed by 1921 a breach of faith. Incorporation, not interest and ideology alone, secured the Zionist cause. There were arenas, however, in which Weizmann's authority was not secure, not least in Geneva itself. Weizmann was treated in Britain, one might say, as the minister for Palestine. In Geneva, however, only actual states were granted representation. Weizmann found the fact that he was treated in Geneva as a petitioner rather than a partner very hard to take, and he soon decided not to hang around outside council meetings, where his status was indistinguishable from that of Shakib Arslan, the representative of the Syro-Palestinian Congress. Instead, he began to cultivate members of the Mandates Commission personally as well as officially, calling on them for friendly chats in their own homes. In the 20s, this adept diplomacy would bear fruit, and a commission that had been mildly pro-Arab would shift course. In 1921 and 1922, however, Weizmann and the Zionist organization lacked that influence and had to rely on Britain. Fortunately, the person representing Britain on the League Council at this moment was none other than a Arthur James Balfour. We turn here then to the third question. How did the mandate for Palestine make its way through the League Council? League approval was not a given. Not because the council was especially hostile to the Palestine mandate, though there was some hostility, but rather because key members of the council or key states on the council were prevaricating about mandates altogether. It was Balfour's task to sort this. But before we explain how, it might be wise to say a few words about Balfour himself. A.J. Balfour is an interesting character. Nephew of a prime minister, enmeshed in intellectual and avant-garde circles, possessed of a lowland Scottish estate, considerable wealth, and a good measure of charm. He was a conservative, albeit a conservative of a particular kind. Balfour thought in terms of national communities bound by traditions and cultures and took hierarchy among peoples for granted. He did not think different races and cultures were equal, or at least he thought the jury was out on that. And he absolutely did not think in terms of rights, at least not in terms of political as opposed to natural rights. Unlike, say, Herbert Samuel, who was a genuinely liberal man, 
and worried conscientiously about the Arab population's hostility to Zionism, Balfour no more thought that Palestinian fellaheen should have political rights than he thought Scottish crofters or Irish tenant farmers should have them. Balfour did believe it was the job of government to deliver peace, order, and if possible, prosperity to populations under its rule. But he thought the governing class and not those at the receiving end of policy knew best how that should be done. It's revealing that Balfour's early posts in government were as Secretary of State for Scotland when Highland crofters tried to resist consolidations of crofts and as Secretary of State for Ireland at the height of the land war. In those positions, he showed himself a modernizer, that Ireland today is a country of proprietary farmers owning their own land and not of landlords and tenants is due to the sweeping land reforms he, his brother Gerald, and his friend George Wyndham pushed through to their own party's consternation. But this was modernization from above, accompanied by a ferocious repression of rural protests that earned Balfour the sobriquet in Ireland of, quote, bloody Balfour. And if it made Irish farmers more prosperous, it did not make them less nationalist. Like so many politicians who think poor men are disaffected because they are poor and not because they are powerless, Balfour never understood Irish nationalism and he never understood Arab nationalism either. He readily believed that if Zionist enterprise brought prosperity to Palestine, Arab opposition to Jewish immigration would vanish. When it didn't, he was just as bewildered as he was when Sinn Féin swept Ireland's now much more prosperous farms and villages. So this is roughly how Balfour thought of the problem of problems of land, race, and nation. But the other point is that, frankly, he didn't think about those very much. A great deal of ink has been spilled on the roots of Balfour's commitment to Zionism. But as Jason Tomes rightly remarks in his study of Balfour's international ideas, if Balfour read deeply and thought hard about Jewish history and culture, he kept all that learning very quiet indeed. Balfour was not Gladstone plowing his way through one theological treatise after another. He did not have Lloyd George's romantic attachment to the idea of the Holy Land, nor did he have Curzon's well-traveled familiarity with the East. He was happier reading French novels or philosophy, and he read epistemology, not political theory, or playing golf or parlor games than he was delving into political questions. He had no trouble making decisive and sometimes fearsome political decisions, but those decisions did not keep him up nights. I don't know whether Balfour actually said the bon mot most often attributed to him. This is, very few things matter, and those that do matter don't matter very much. <laughs> but it does capture his insouciance fairly well. Born into wealth and politics, inheriting the prime ministership from his uncle in 1902, but utterly incapable of dealing with ambitious and charismatic challengers like Joseph Chamberlain, Balfour led a conservative government that John Morley, a liberal, in 1905 called the worst since the Stuarts. And he led it in 1906 into the, one of the most disastrous election defeats in modern history, a conservative wipeout in which most of the cabinet not to mention himself, a sitting prime minister, lost their seats. One was found for him, and he hung on to the party leadership until 1911, but everyone thought he was washed up. But the wartime coalition governments gave him a second wind and a second chance, returning him to cabinet, this time to the posts, to posts suited to his talents and character. Foreign Secretary from December 1916 until October 1919, then a kind of roving commission as Lord President of Council until the fall of the Lloyd George Coalition in October 1922 when he was 74. He was a diplomat by nature, and the government got used to putting him in charge of tricky missions, especially to America and then to Geneva. He was valuable at the peace conference and mildly favorable to the League of Nations. And when he turned over the foreign secretaryship to Curzon, no friend to Zionism, in October of 1919, Lloyd George gratefully left coping with the new organization in Balfour's hands. Balfour liked doing that, but he had his vanity too and wasn't inclined to let British authority 
or the declaration that bore his name be revised to nothing by Wilsonian idealists in the League Secretariat or Italian cardinals and French normaliens who sought to interfere in Palestine's affairs. Balfour's first in intervention was thus to restrict the League Assembly's authority over the mandate's regime. The long delay in bringing the system into effect had caused much unease, especially as Arab protests at the Middle East dispensation had been circulated to all League states. At the first League Assembly in November 1920, the humanitarian explorer Fritjof Nansen and, ironically, Balfour's own cousin, Lord Robert Cecil, insisted on the Assembly's right to re receive and review the still unpublished mandate texts. Balfour, head of the British delegation, issued a sharp reproof. The responsibility for dealing with the mandates lay with the council alone, he told the assembly. He, for one, would consider himself entirely free to deal with them, quote, unrestricted by anything which the assembly might do. The assembly called on the mandatory powers to issue the mandates without further delay, but it was clear that the great power dominated council and not the more rambunctious and democratic assembly would review and approve them. Or it would if the powers actually agreed. As Balfour already knew, when it came to the mandate system, the wartime allies were very much at odds. In October 1920, the League Council had declined to deal with the Middle East mandates because the Savra Treaty had not been ratified, but even more because the United States had not consented. Almost a year later, the council was still citing lack of American agreement. For the British, that American obstruction must have been an especially bitter pill. The mandates plan had been pushed through at the peace conference to please Wilson. The planned mandate section was placed first under an American, and Balfour hoped that the US would accept the mandate for Palestine. The US rejection of the treaty shattered those hopes Worse, having decided not to take part in an institution on which they had insisted, the Americans seemed to want to render it unworkable. As an allied power, but not a member of the League, the US declared, it would insist on a separate treaty with each power holding mandates in order to guarantee its own rights in each and every territory to which the system would apply. Squaring the Americans was thus a first and rather daunting task. In December 1921, more than a year after the first assembly, the Colonial Office asked Washington to come to agreement over the Palestine mandate at least, leaving Iraq for the future. On his official's advice, Winston Churchill telegraphed Balfour. He was colonial, Balfour, uh, Churchill was colonial secretary who was in Washington as British Secretary to the Naval Conference asking him to do what he could to get the Americans moving. Balfour duly wrote to Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes on January 13, 1922, pointing out the delicacy of Britain's task in Palestine and his hope that the United States would do what it could to lighten the load. They were dealing with a country, Balfour said, in which the majority of the population was Arab, but, and I quote, in which there is an important Jewish minority to whom we desire largely to entrust the task of fitting the country with the help of outside Jewish assistance to be the home, a home for the Jewish race, end quote. This challenge could be dealt with successfully only if Britain's position were seen by the whole population to be secure. Might Hughes give the matter his attention? Hughes' response two weeks later wasn't designedly unfriendly, Balfour told Churchill, but it certainly was unsatisfactory. It shows, too, just how little all Wilson's speechifying about self-determination amounted to. Hughes showed no concern for local interests, Jewish or Arab, only for American rights. Since the U.S. had enjoyed capitulary rights by treaty with the Ottoman Empire, he said, a new treaty would have to be negotiated, abrogating or replacing those rights. The United States would need assurances about equal treatment of U.S. citizens and companies, safeguards to ensure the rights of American missionaries, and rights for U.S. citizens to be tried in courts with a majority of British judges. The Foreign Office duly got to work negotiating such a treaty. By April, they were near agreement. <clears throat> 
The British government thus hoped finally to get the mandate through with the League Council's May session, and not before time with the Arab delegation still cooling its heels in London and Samuel frankly worried about the state of the country. Balfour was dispatched with a team to Geneva. He was obviously the best man for the job, but when he showed up, he discovered new problems. No real work had been done to square the French and the Italians either, and both were going to cause trouble. Telling Balfour privately that their governments, while willing to wake, make warm noises in public, were under no circumstances going to let the Palestine mandate go through. What was the problem now? For France, it wasn't the Zionist cast of the text. True, France had always thought, to quote the Quai d'Orsay's Philippe Berthaillot, the text, quote, much too Judaized and Judaizing. When Milleron saw the British draft shortly after the San Remo conference, again, according to Berthaillot, he had nearly jumped out of his skin. But Berthaillot told Van Sittard of the Foreign Office that, quote, if we like to run ourselves into trouble, that seemed to him our own affair. And by 1922, French officials felt a kind of schadenfreude as well. Given how directly, in their view, Britain had contributed to their problems in Syria, first by encouraging Faisal's regime there, and then after France had expelled him by installing Faisal in Iraq and Abdullah in Transjordan, the Quai d'Orsay was, if anything, pleased to see Britain floundering in Palestine. The French, quote, believe it is our deliberate intention to make their position in Syria impossible, British intelligence reported in August 1921, and had no interest in helping them at all. But French foot dragging was rooted in more than imperial rivalry. It was also strategic, a sign of how much France hoped, once the Americans were gone, to avoid the constraints of mandatory oversight altogether. Even in 1919, British colonial secretary said, the French were determined just to be squatters in Syria, and then by mere lapse of time to become owners. Three years later, the French were still playing that game. This wasn't stupid on their part. Unlike the British, who imagined that internationalization would confer legitimacy, the French always and rightly understood that it implied constraint. The Syrian mandate just wasn't ready, Poincaré informed the British ambassador on May 10, 1922, and surely the Council ought to treat the Middle East mandates together. Palestine would have to wait on French pleasure. And as Balfour discovered, delay suited the Italians too. Italy resented the whole Middle East settlement, feeling it had been shortchanged. But early on, the Italian attitude to the Palestine mandate had mirrored that of the French. That is, as Van Sittart reported, they think us foolish and asking for trouble, but that is our affair. Two years later, objections had crystallized, stoked above all by the Vatican. Indeed, as Balfour reported to the cabinet, quote, the intervention of the ba Vatican was the real problem. It's hardly surprising that the Vatican would have expressed an interest in the fate of the Holy Land, and the British National Archives contain records of repeated diplomatic démarche in 1920 and 1921 to calm papal fears. Herbert Samuel stopped in Rome in July 1920 to assure the Pope and Vatican State Secretary Cardinal Gaspari that Britain did not intend to place Muslims and Christians under Jewish rule. The Vatican professed itself reassured, but a year later was restive. In June 1921, the Pope gave an address stating that the situation of Christians in Palestine was worse than under the Turks. This time, Jerusalem Governor Ronald Storr broke his trip in Rome to calm him down. Between March and May of 1922, however, Br British diplomats, not to mention Weizmann, were blindsided by an open Vatican denunciation of British policy in <laughs> Palestine sent as well to the League Council, which had no real option but to circulate it. The mandate, Countess Alice at the Vatican, wrote to the British ambassador in March, violated Article 22 of the League Covenant, which explicitly stated that native population's interests were not to be subordinated. The British ambassador and Weizmann both scrambled to reassure the Holy See, but it was no use. On May 15, 1922, Gaspari informed the Council that the Holy See could not agree, and I quote, that the Jews should be given a privileged and preponderating position as against other nationalities and creeds, or that the rights of Christians should not be adequately safeguarded. Balfour was convinced that no state on the Council cared all that much about British policy in Palestine. Largely Catholic countries were, however, loath to support Britain against the Holy See. 
the reluctance of the French, the Spanish, the Polish, the Italian, and the Brazilian representatives on the council to even discuss the Palestine mandate, he said to London, and I quote, has been due to the representatives, representations that have been made to their governments by papal representatives. That, combined with what Balfour considered a legitimate French appeal to consider Palestine and Syria together, ended any hope of getting the mandates through that May. But if Balfour had no choice but to call for another special council meeting, specifically to deal with those mandates, he also insisted that the council hold a public meeting to, as he put it, and I quote, make clear to the world at large the position of his majesty's government. He would use publicity, the international platform of the league, to put those who would thwart British policy in their place. At the same time, Balfour redefined and clarified that policy, putting his own distinctive print on questions that had unsettled Palestine for more than four years. He did all he could first to undermine the claim that the mandate was in danger. The reasons for delay, he said, were purely technical, a consequence of the need to complete negotiations with the Americans. It might be natural to interpret delay as a sign of indecision, but, quote, that error is a grave one. British policy was not under review and would not change. This was certainly a sweeping dismissal of the uncertainty about British policy rife within the political establishment. As we know, Curzon disliked the mandate, the Lords had denounced it, and even Samuel had moved some distance from his earlier stance. Balfour, however, admitted none of this. Instead, he shifted responsibility for destabilizing Palestine onto his colleagues in the room. Certainly the British government did not desire to rush anyone, he said, but the council should remember that their actions had, quote, some inconvenient repercussions in Palestine itself. They were postponing the stabilizing application of a text that, quote, will become part of a fixed and authoritative law of nations. He reserved his harshest words only very lightly disguised for the Vatican. Balfour may have been a religious skeptic, but he was a communicant member of the Church of England, someone who was accustomed by party and upbringing to uphold Christian rights. The gloves came off. And I quote, I confess to feeling, I will not say indignation, that would be too strong a word, but surprise that any human being should suppose that Christian interests should suffer by the transfer of power in Palestine from a Mohammedan to a Christian power. And my surprise is not diminished when I reflect that that Christian power is Great Britain. He rejected absolutely any implication that Britain could not fairly govern all faiths. Balfour's performance at that May Council meeting, more reminiscent of Ireland's bloody Balfour than of his emollient diplomatic persona, made a difference. A council meeting was set for July in London, and the colonial office girded itself for one final push. Much work was put into completing the convention with the United States. When the Italians continued to carp, Britain assured Italy in writing that the policy of the Jewish national home was not intended to subordinate non the non-Jewish population, that there would be no discrimination against Italian workers or Italian schools, and that should an Italian economic zone materialize in the Mediterranean, Britain would negotiate a trade agreement with it. Vatican concerns about Christian rights concerning holy places were met. Herbert Samuel, for his part, tried once again to conciliate Arab opinion by drafting what became the White Paper of 1922, a document that stipulated that immigration must be based on the, quote, absorptive capacity of the country and that Britain did not intend to supplant the Arabs in Palestine. Officials kept in touch cautiously with the French. If the mandate didn't go through this time, they worried it might never do so. It did go through, but barely. The French submitted the mandate for Syria so late that the Italian representative said he had no instructions from his government about it. The French representative then said that if the Syrian mandate weren't considered, the Palestine mandate couldn't be considered either. Balfour, frustrated, said bluntly that if the Italian representative didn't cable his government asking for permission to move forward, he would make Italian responsibility for delay public. The Marquis Imperiali reluctantly cabled Rome, the Italian government reluctantly agreed to approve the text with a reservation about one clause on holy places. Weizmann cabled his thanks to Balfour and Churchill, and after nine months in Britain, the Arab delegation headed home. <laughs>
So four and a half years after the Balfour Declaration was issued, the Mandate for Palestine, a legal instrument incorporating the Declaration and committing Britain to administer the territory in such a way as to facilitate its realization was finally accepted by the League Council. This was Balfour's last service to the Zionist cause. Like Churchill, Samuel, and the rest of the statesmen who had worked for this end, he hoped that arguments would now calm down and Palestine would be prosperous and governable. But was this actually the effect of internationalization? Did this effort stabilize and legitimize British policy? It did not. Let me close by reflecting on the unintended consequences of internationalization. To understand those effects, it's important to realize that the League was never simply a British creature. It would evolve in ways Britain couldn't control. Balfour could not foresee this. It was unimaginable to him that a mandate British officials had helped to craft would in the end hamper British policy. But the dynamic of internationalization was unstoppable. Arab and Jewish interests would both establish offices in Geneva, petitioning, petitions alleging violations of the mandate would pour in, and the mandate's commission, guide, guided by the ambitious Swiss lawyer William Rappard, would assert its authority. The complexities of Palestine meant that the commission poured over the mandate and scrutinized British policy especially closely. Through the 20s, that scrutiny did not hamper British policy. Although initially inclined to doubt that the Zionist pledge was compatible with Article 22 of the Covenant, which was the main Arab contention, by the mid-20s, the Commission had come to accept the joint British and Zionist argument that Jewish immigration and settlement would not harm the condition of the Arab majority. That meant, however, that when a government inquiry concluded in 1930 that it had, and proposed to limit Jewish immigration, the Commission considered that a clear violation of the mandate. No deviation could be allowed. Having always professed its support for the mandate system and for international law, Britain thus found it could not shift course without repudiating the mandate and the League's oversight regime. In 1939, after the Arab Revolt and the failure of the Peel Partition Plan, as we know, Britain did so. In a 180 degree reversal of course, it declared that the dual obligations were incompatible and the mandate unworkable and it intended to halt immigration and work out a roadmap to a unitary binational state. The war, of course, would render those plans nugatory. But what's important for our purposes is that that change in course happened in 1939 and not in 1930, a 10 year time lag that made possible the doubling of Palestine's Jewish population as the Nazi regime and anti-Semitic East European states sought to extrude Jews. By the outbreak of the war, the Yishuv counted a third of the population of Palestine and could survive. Internationalization, in other words, sheltered the Zionist project even after the British lost heart. Not the Balfour Declaration, but rather the incorporation of the Declaration into the mandate for Palestine was A.J. Balfour's lasting service to Zionism. Thank you very much.